millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Hey, I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. And today we're talking how you earn, save and spend your money with Alana Oaken. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. So what does how you earn, save, and spend your money really say about your overall relationship with money? Well, a lot, right? It, it tells the whole story of you know, the way you think, act, and feel about your money, what you feel is a priority, where you want to spend your money. I mean, it's it's the nitty gritty about our relationship with money. And some of us spend money to, you know, look the part in our careers. And then some of us get away with things like, you know, comfy yoga pants and ripped sweaters. Although I'm going to urge you, don't ever wear a ripped sweater to work. I just think it sends the really, really wrong message. But, you know, how we put ourselves together out in the world, it also says a lot about us and, you know, how we spend our money to create that that image, that feel of what we're about does say a lot about our relationship with money. And so what writer Alana Oakham, who is on this podcast, found in her series, How Do You Shop on Racked, is that The uniqueness to spending and saving money is also the tie that binds us together. So what I love about this series, How Do You Shop, is they're talking to real people, real women all across the U.S. and finding out, you know, not just how they earn, save, and spend their money, but really that story behind their money and the relationship with the money and how does how you shop influence that relationship with your money. So I was so excited to have Alana on the podcast. She is a superstar. She has been all over TV. She previously worked at BuzzFeed prior to Racked. She's written a ton of articles and she just really knows her stuff. And she also shares her really cool money story herself, you know, from working on this series for Racked she really had the chance to uncover her own money journey and, you know, kind of refine and figure out those different money lessons. She tells this cool story about, you know, tracking her income and, and you know, kind of getting out um, on her own in New York City, which is a tough feat for anybody. I mean, it is one of the most, if not the most expensive place to live. And it, it takes a lot of money smarts to to figure it out because, you know, especially as a writer in your career, you might not be making, you know, a ton of money, right? You're probably not making millions of dollars. She's making a good living. But through this career and through her her passions and through really uncovering the stories of other women across the U.S., it's really helping her shape, you know, her own smart money moves. And I think these are really cool stories to share because, I think it really shows how unique we all are, but how similar we all are. And I think if we really 
realize that like to our core, it would make talking about money so much easier for all of us. So I am a senior editor at Racked, where I've been for a little over a year now. Uh, before that, I was at BuzzFeed for many, many years. Um, and I wanted to come to Racked because it's just this really small, dynamic, amazing site that's all about basically the cu- culture of shopping. Um, and so that can be all kinds of things. It's, uh, you know, we've got service pieces about where to get backpacks and winter jackets, um, but we've also got these big reports about, you know, how, uh, for example, black women have been served by the beauty industry or not served for hundreds of years. Um, we've got these long form features. We just published one about uh, the sort of socioeconomic realities of waiting in line and why stores, you know, develop these lines. So it really yes, kind of I, runs that one is for, yeah, <laughs> that one is fascinating because you'll you'll find cool? you'll find you know places where you're like they could have easily designed this store to not have a line. And yet, you know, the theory of having a line makes us all want to be in that store. Yeah, exactly. And we had this great, great writer named Jamie Kalis who just went along on that. Um, And so really, yeah, we kind of cover everything to do with shopping and how people spend money. Uh, And it's really fun to have a job where I get to kind of zero in with this ostensibly narrow entry point, but actually like we never ever run out of things to cover. In fact, like the job is really sort of narrowing out and figuring out like, oh, what what do we really want to be focusing our attention on? Um, And maybe about six months ago, we were talking about really wanting to focus more on money, on how normal people spend their money throughout the country um, at different aspects of their lives, because obviously that ties into shopping in such an extreme degree. Uh, And so the sort of first part of that initiative was starting this How Do You Shop series. And I edit that and I actually also write a fair number of them as well. Uh, But usually what it consists of is either I or a freelance writer will interview someone from just around the country. I think we've done almost 30 of these by now. Um, And we've had everyone from, you know, a single mother of five who started her own business to a retiree living in Florida to a freelance photographer making $20,000 a year. Uh, So really just all kinds of people. And I have sort of a standard boilerplate questionnaire, but I really just tell the writers and myself to completely go off script and just get people's, you know, stories and their backgrounds and their theories of money and their philosophies. Um, And so that's been really fascinating to just kind of slowly but surely amass this body of work all about how people regard money. Um, And it's really kind of seeped into my own life as well, because, you know, I'm 27. I'm sort of at this phase in my life where I'm really figuring out what my future goals are going to be, what my plans are, and really sort of reckoning with my money for not the first time, but the first serious and sustained time in my life. And I've really picked up a lot of strategies just from, you know, day-to-day exposure to these stories that I'm writing and editing. Yeah, that's so super cool. I love the idea of storytelling through sharing people's lives because I think more so than just blanket tips, you know, the stories are really what brings, uh, you know, a tough subject like money to life. So tell me, like, what are some of maybe the biggest surprises or trends that you found from this series around, you know, shopping and spending? Absolutely. First of all, just sort of generally speaking, I have always been so pleasantly surprised and delighted by how open people are. I mean, maybe it's self-selecting because, you know, the people who agree to be interviewed for a series like this do kind of know what they're getting themselves into. But just the second I hop on the phone with these people or, you know, get into a transcript that a writer sent along, people are so eager to talk about everything, what they make, you know, what their rent is, if they have assistance, what their, you know, sort of pitfalls are, what their goals are. And that's been really heartening because I think, it's not that money wasn't something I thought about. Like, obviously, I've always thought about it my whole life. But I think I at times sort of had this, you know, if I don't look too closely, it won't make me too anxious kind of method to my madness, essentially. Um, and realizing that just, you know, that doesn't have to be that way, that people are going to be really excited to sort of sit down and help you and talk through strategies. It can just be really enlightening and it makes you feel less alone. Um, and when it comes to sort of the nitty gritty of it, it's been really interesting because we've, you know, interviewed people with at all different income levels, all kinds of debt, all kinds of backgrounds. But the anxiety always kind of seems to be the same. Like it doesn't feel totally contingent on whether you have a lot of money or a little money, um, whether or not, you know, you're going to feel like, oh, shoot, like I'm living paycheck to paycheck or, you know, I'm so like I'm, I'm feeling comfortable right now. It really feels like that varies and isn't, you know, there's no causation necessarily built in there. So that's been something that's really interesting that's emerged as well. And I think that's a really cool point that you make because, you know, I, I talk a lot on this podcast about, 
the theory of that, you know, uh, b- budgeting and being smart with your money, it, it doesn't discriminate. So, you know, Absolutely. you could be you could be somebody who's making, you know, $30,000 a year and you could be in such a great financial position and somebody who makes a million dollars a year is completely underwater and living paycheck to paycheck. 100%. And I think most people don't don't have um access to that information because, you know, we, we just think, well, the person making more money must have more money. And I think that's so cool mm-hmm. that you, that you found that that's not necessarily the truth. Yeah, not at all. I almost feel like if I had to plot it on a graph, you know, of like satisfaction to income level, it would just be like a complete scatter plot, you know, like it would just be all off in every corner. Um, yeah. So that's been really, really interesting. And I'm also just, you know, because we are a site that deals with clothes and with shopping and with what you put on your body, I'm very interested and how people talk about um, self-presentation and how sort of shopping helps them create this version of themselves that they then bring out into the world. Um, So, you know, we have people who only like to go thrift shopping. We have people who, you know, are very, very committed to like one brand or another. Um, I actually just, uh, we just had a really great interview last week with a woman who is a local TV news anchor in Kansas City. And she had such interesting things to say because she came from a very low income background um, and was actually even living in income based housing when she started out on TV, but really kind of had to figure out how to put together a wardrobe that was sort of, you know, TV worthy and how to kind of find frugal ways to manufacture this version of herself that like her viewers would trust. Um, And she also had the, um, the sort of challenge of being a black woman in this market that was primarily white and realizing that that meant that in some level she had to straighten her hair, she had to look a certain way. And it's so interesting that a conversation about money can sort of then turn into this conversation about how you live in the world um, and how you present yourself. And, you know, I, I just really love what these conversations become as they go on. That's so fascinating. You know, you you just on surface think that, you know, it, you're talking just about shopping and spending. And I love that, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're digging deeper. And I think what that really uncovers is that, you know, this subject around money, it's so rooted in, you know, almost every decision we make, whether we're conscious of it or not. And I think that yes. you know, so many people want to just discount, well, I don't even want to think about money. I don't want to focus on <laughs> it. I don't, you know, whatever it is, but it, it, it's something that you, you can't ignore, you know, it, and it's not that it should be the biggest, you know, facet of your life, of course, right. that, that's not good. But, you know, the way it seeps into all of your decision making, I think is is really fascinating when you think about it. No, absolutely. And like, right, to my own sort of relationship with money, it was probably only in this last year that I really started writing down everything I was spending, you know, like making sure that I was looking at my bank account every day most of the time, like really just kind of, and not in any sort of judgmental or, you know, like punitive way, but just sort of, I wanted to know exactly what was coming in and exactly what was going out because it's it's pretty shameful to admit, but I think for the first at least 25 years of my life, I sort of knew that it was okay, that I was earning a little bit more than I was spending. So things were good. And like, it was kind of just this, again, it was sort of don't ask, don't tell, you know, like if, if I don't know, it won't freak me out that I'm spending too much on Ubers or beers or, you know, what have you. Uh, but really editing this series, I'm not sure if it's chicken or egg, or it was just time for me to kind of get my shit together. Sorry, <laughs> crap together. Um, but I really wanted to just kind of sit down and take stock of everything. And it's not as scary as you think it is once you really kind of put pen to paper. Yeah. I mean, do you find that it it makes you feel more empowered? Absolutely. So what I do now, and this is just a very sort of ad hoc system, like I've spoken with people who, you know, use different apps or are much more sort of regimented in their recording. Uh, But what I do is I have a little phone note um, that I, you know, just have it in the notes section of my iPhone and I write down every day whatever I'm spending. Um, And so those break down into a couple categories, such as entertainment or shopping or household expenses. And each week I tally it up and put all that into a Google spreadsheet. And, you know, I've really probably only been doing it now for maybe like 22 or 23 weeks, but that's enough to kind of get a sense of patterns. And it really helped me kind of form like a flexible and dynamic budget where I can know if like, oh, this was a pretty light week or this was a pretty heavy week. And again, it's just, it's not something where I'm punishing myself or constantly trying to make sure that it's completely in these parameters, but it allows me to sort of regard money in the way that it makes sense in my own life. So that's been just really, I, I'm actually 
actually very proud of that. That like might be the biggest thing that I did for myself in 2017 was really just kind of like putting my butt in a chair and <laughs> figuring out what exactly I was spending. Yeah, no, and what you just said is so powerful. I'm not even sure, you know, you you realize how powerful that is because <laughs> I think, you know, what like what you're saying is really what I talk about a lot is that you now yeah. have control over the different goals and different things that you want to achieve in life because you know where your cash is going and you can make yeah. those, those changes really easily and reroute money. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. Daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short-form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be buried in an avalanche? weird foreign feeling of despair or how it feels to crash a skydive i remember hearing a thud feeling my body hit the ground or how you would react 
If you were being attacked by an alligator. At the end of my leg is this huge alligator head on my leg. These are the stories you'll hear on the podcast called What Was That Like? True stories told by the actual person who went through it. You'll hear from a victim of an attack. Dragging me into the bathroom and saying, I'm going to kill you. Now you're going to die. You'll hear from a man who discovered a baby. How could this be? How could there be a baby on the ground? And you'll hear actual 911 calls. Plinky County 911. There's a man at my back door. He's trying to get in. What Was That Like is a podcast about real people in unreal situations. Search for What Was That Like on any podcast app or at whatwasthatlike.com. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash CD specials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. No, exactly. It's really, it's all kind of tied into, I mean, maybe this is just what you do, you know, when you hit your late twenties and you start to take stock of everything. But I think like this was what, this was also the year that I really started to take seriously going to the gym, you know, getting regular doctor visits, uh, curtailing drinking, really making lunch before work, you know, things like that, that are, I think my 22 year old self would regard as sort of these boring, you know, concessions to adulthood, like who cares about that? But it, it makes me feel so much better on a day-to-day basis and money really plays into that as well. Just like, yeah, knowing that I'm sort of the master of my domain really gives me a lot of comfort in a time that can feel really uncertain and like you can't control anything else going on in the world. Yeah, that that's so incredibly powerful. And are there any, you know, interesting tips or creative ways that you've learned through the series through talking to these people of how, you know, somebody could, you know, shop and, and present themselves in a good way where maybe they're on, you know, just a super tight budget? Yeah, absolutely. So one woman um, who I loved talking to, her name was Dana Balch, and she lives in New York City as well. Um, And we just had such a great conversation. And she was talking about, you know, she doesn't make a ton of money. I mean, you know, she makes probably I think it was like $55,000, which, you know, in New York City doesn't always go a long way. But she manages it in such a smart way, where she has five different bank accounts. But it's basically it's not as complicated as it sounds. It's essentially the envelope method, where, you know, she has her sort of short term checking account, that's sort of her fund money. She's got her longer term for rent, for things like that. Uh, She's got her savings account for vacations. And I love that, that when she gets a paycheck, she just immediately automatically divides it up into these different categories so that she can always see exactly what she has and can always sort of know like, okay, if I need to go shopping this season, these are the, this is the dollars that I have available to me. And I think it seems like it really sort of helped her assuage some guilt, really feel control again over her finances. And I was definitely inspired by that and actually ended up opening like a second checking account that I put my hard expenses in. Um, Like that's my rent, that's my therapy and my utilities, like any amount of money I know I'm going to spend over the course of a month, I put in that account. And so then sort of whatever is left over in that topmost account is kind of my shopping, you know, my fun money and anything left over there, you know, goes to vacation or wedding savings or anything like that. Yeah. And I think that's great. Well, just what you said, you know, that could work for, for anything, whether you love to travel or yeah. you know, you're saving for a wedding or buying a car, or, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I think we've grown up with this idea that we are supposed to have like one checking account and one savings account. Yeah. And, you know, I've always asked like, well, how many is too many? I'm like, well, however many make sense mm-hmm. to you, you know, I mean, if, yeah, exactly. if you need to you name, it. <laughs> yeah, name them different things, like have fun with, I think the more your, your money and your, your system and your journey can come alive for you, the more you're going to be, mm-hmm. you know, um, you're going to feel, you know, a desire to, to keep up with this stuff every month. Absolutely. And another piece of advice that I really loved, which was from this woman who I think I mentioned at the top of the show is a mother of five and an entrepreneur. She's so, so great. Um, and she was talking, she said this piece of wisdom that she said she got from somewhere else, but I'd never heard it before, which is that you wear 20% of your clothes 80% of the time. And that was so smart and immediately made me sort of run down through my wardrobe and think like, oh yeah, that shirt that I'm always washing every week because I love wearing it so much, those pants that fit perfectly. And I think that that's such a smart way not to say that you have to break that down by a dollar amount, but I think it can really help justify purchases, especially of basics or of things that you know you absolutely love and will wear into the ground. 
to just spend a little more on them. Like that's definitely something that if you're able to do it, I highly recommend as opposed to sort of going the, you know, fast fashion, this thing's going to disintegrate within three washes route, just because also I think it saves so much effort as well. And I think that that's something we don't always talk about, especially in America, that time is money too. And the amount of time and effort and energy you spend chasing down clothing, chasing down, you know, whatever it is that you need in order to kind of go through your daily life is as valuable as, you know, the money you make (laughs) and like the wages you're paid. So that's something I think about too, is what can you do to sort of set it and forget it and just like make your life as easy for yourself as possible. Yeah. Like that's the sweet spot, I think, because we, you know, when you can get there, I think you open up so much more time to do lots of other things that you, that you should be doing to be more productive in life. Very cool. So you have had such an interesting career already at such a young age. Tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of your journey and and how you, uh, you know, have gotten to have this this amazing career of writing and living in New York City and coming out with a book and all of that great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been great. Um, So, gosh, I mean, I went to college in upstate New York. And it's funny because I never really saw myself as wanting to live in New York City. It always, you know, I'm from Boston, which is much smaller. uh, And that always seemed about as much city as I could handle. Um, You know, kind of this place that closed down at midnight and had like 600,000 residents. But a lot of my friends ended up moving to New York after graduation. um, And I got into this publishing course that was just like a summer program. um, Because I kind of didn't know what else to do. Like I knew I wanted to write, but I wasn't really sure what that would look like. I would had like one internship, but I hadn't had the like bajillion that a lot of people seem to have had. But I came to New York to do this course, uh, wound up meeting my best friend in the world uh, who actually lived in New York. And she invited me to come stay with her and her family while I figured out like what the heck I was going to do with my life. So I applied to probably like 30 jobs. You know, I was just like manically applying to jobs in her like parents living room. Um, And I got this internship at BuzzFeed that was like better paid than most of the like entry level jobs I was looking at at some other places. Um, And so I was like, okay, like this is back in 2012. I don't think people even like super like BuzzFeed was just sort of starting to come onto the scene then. But it just seemed like such a fun, experimental, zany place to be. And so I showed up for that internship and then didn't leave for five years because that was true. You know, it was just this really lovely place to kind of throw things at the wall and see what stuck. Um, And in that time, I got really, really interested in sort of honing in on this lifestyle space on, you know, what people put in and on and around their bodies. Um, And I'm a big crafter as well. Like I'm a big knitter and crocheter. And so then um, I ended up writing a couple of essays about that, about how, especially Especially knitting has really helped me calm down a lot of my anxiety and sort of metabolize grief and even find joy and sort of been this uh, this regular thing. And I ended up um, selling a book based on that that's coming out in March. So that's been years and years in the making. And I'm very, very nervous and very excited about it. Um, and, you know, I came over to Racked about a year ago and it's been wonderful and they've been so supportive. So I don't know. It really was just it's been so nice to sort of see these things fall into place because I don't think I knew that my job existed when I was graduating college. I'm actually not even sure if my job did exist when I was graduating college and who knows, you know, if it will in five years from now, but I don't know. I think there are such good, smart people in this industry and so many industries that a lot of what I did was just kind of trying to see where those people were and what they were doing. And, you know, could I come along and sort of help make stuff along with them? And, you know, it's not always easy. And there's constantly like changing platelets in this industry um, and in the city, certainly. But I don't know, it's just it's very satisfying to feel like I'm putting something into the world that wasn't there before and that maybe will help someone get a little bit of a stronger sense of themselves or get a little bit more of a handle on their own lives. Wow, that is so exciting. I mean, I can definitely get a sense that your future is going to be as amazing as uh, (laughs) just all of those things. You know, I think that's so cool when you can find your your spot, you know, your niche. And, you know, it's always going to be refining. But, um, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, it's so much easier said than done, too. Like, I think part of it, you know, like, it is so expensive to live in this city. And like, there are so many times when like, yeah, I do have pretty severe anxiety, and I can feel really overwhelmed by sort of whatever's going on in the world or in my own head. Like, you know, it's not all sort of happy go lucky, like next, you know, next step perfect. But I don't know. Yeah, I've definitely found that as we were saying earlier, like, being able to take stock in these small ways, at least making sure that like my day can look how it feels good for me. Like that, that makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, again, therapy is a great thing too. (laughs) Yeah. I am a huge proponent of that. I don't think there's any (laughs) shame in it at all. Exactly. It's like money, you know, it's good to talk about. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So last question, if 
we just suddenly magically dropped like a million dollars in your bank account, what would you be doing? That's a great question. I think I would definitely want to buy property. Um, And I know it sounds crazy, but a million dollars actually doesn't go crazy far in New York City. Um, But I would probably want to buy like a two or three bedroom apartment in like my neighborhood, Bed-Stuy, which I love so much. Um, And if I had any left over, my like pie in the sky dream has always been to open some kind of like cool, maybe nonprofit uh, retail space. So like a yarn store bar or some sort of community center where people can all gather together. And again, I don't think a million dollars would go that far, but maybe it would be enough to like, you know, the first couple months of rent on a space like that or some seed money or anything like that. But I think it would really just be all in the service of like my current life, but a little more stable, which is sort of a good feeling, you know, to feel like, oh, okay, I want this, but maybe like a little bit more. Yeah. A yarn star store bar. I think that is going oh, yeah. to be. Me and my sister talk about this all the time. Like something that I could like run on the weekends while still having my actual job. And like, maybe my sister could come and be the like manager during the week. <laughs> That definitely sounds like a very cool aspirational place. All right, Alana, (laughs) this has been amazing. Tell people where they can find you and where they can find the How Do You Shop series. Yeah, absolutely. So racks.com, R-A-C-K-E-D. And then How Do You Shop? You can just look it up on the site. Um, And then my Twitter handle is just Alana, A-L-A-N-N-A. Honestly, it's turning into a guilty pleasure now reading these articles and these stories on how do you shop. I find myself just like completely engrossed about other people's lives. I mean, even being a money expert, I still find it really interesting how people think, act, and feel about money. So I know if you check it out, you're going to get hooked, hopefully just as much as I do. But I think it also makes you think about well, how do you shop? And how does that influence your money relationship? And what kind of story does that tell about you? I think if we can stand back and think about money in that way, it it brings on a whole different purpose to our lives. As always, you can follow me t- on Twitter and Instagram at Shauna Game. And if you love this podcast, hey, do me a favor, share it on social media, shout it out to your friends, and head on over to the link in the show notes to leave us a five-star review. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.